We are jumping back into the Cold War, specifically about how the Vietnam War fits in with the Cold War. And we're going to do things a little differently. One minute to start writing. The notes are a little shorter, and then I'm going to start explaining, and you can continue to write. The story of Vietnam begins back when we're just talking about all the Cold War uh, ideas that we mentioned two, uh, two chapters ago. So with President Kennedy, one of his main goals was to try and end the Cold War. The way that you, it would end a Cold War is to have peaceful negotiations with the other country. So President Kennedy wanted peaceful negotiations with the Soviet Union, which at that time was led by Nikita Khrushchev. So his idea was to create these different programs that would promote peace around the world with like the United States at the center. The Peace Corps and the Alliance for Progress were part of that. Peace Corps is still in existence to today and American volunteers go out around the world, particularly to countries that are impoverished, and they might do something such as uh, community projects, building irrigation systems, building um, small dams so that people have fresh water to drink. In other cases, they'll go there and they will teach. And the idea is, is that we as American citizens go to these countries and we promote American values, which then creates at a very local level alliances between those countries and the United States. Alliance for Progress was trying to amend for decades of abusing our relationship with South American countries, uh, or what we used to call the good neighbor policy. But we weren't, we've never really been good neighbors to our friends here in the Western Hemisphere. President Kennedy was trying to fix that. And I'm not going to spend too much time on the Bay of Pigs invasion because we've already talked about that in, when we talked last chapter about President Kennedy's legacy. But what you need to remember is that it was a CIA program. It was not an American military program. It was an American intelligence program where we trained Cubans who had left when Fidel Castro, who's pictured in the top right hand corner, when he took over Cuba along with his other communist rebels. So pro-democratic Cubans had to leave or they were, a lot of them were executed, those that stayed behind and fought against Castro. And again with this it was a huge failure. Castro finds out that we're sending Cubans back to the island to try and overthrow him and his government and those men are slaughtered. Even though Kennedy did not plan it, he took full responsibility for it. That was a big loss for Kennedy. A win was the Cuban Missile Crisis and that the Soviet Union's placing nuclear missiles in Cuba, which is 90 miles off the southern shore of the United States, well within striking range. And Kennedy blockades Cuba, surrounds it with ships, and tells the Soviet Union, not only can they not deliver any more missiles, but they have to remove those missiles from there. And through diplomatic negotiations, as well as just straight up stubbornness, Kennedy gets the Soviets, A, to turn back their ships, and then to remove those missiles from Cuba. There's a huge win for President Kennedy. All right, moving on. One minute. 
little late on that. I'll start it. All right, so we went, I went ahead and jumped into the continuation of that Cuban Missile Crisis. So we'll move down to the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. A new, another win for Kennedy. Um, so uh, in terms of foreign relations, he kind of was on a big winning streak. Um, and again, that was his focus in his first term. Again, he didn't know that he was going to be assassinated. So... His focus first term was to calm the rest of the world down. Then, I, again, now that we look back at it, was his second term, if he was reelected, would have been focused on domestic problems, on civil rights issues and uh, economic inequality that was continuing to grow in the United States. Anyway, the big deal here is, is that Kennedy gets the Soviet Union to sign a nuclear test ban treaty which uh, on paper was, was that they, e either nation could no longer test nuclear weapons above ground. That's the key thing, right? Now, but what this means is, is that if you can't really test those weapons and you make it harder, more difficult to test nuclear weapons, in this case it would have to be underground or deep in the ocean is where they ended up testing them. It's gonna make it harder to produce those uh, those weapons. So the more hoops you got to jump through, the less you actually want to do it. So it actually starts decreasing the amount of nuclear weapons that are created among the two nations. Uh, we'll get into what other nations are doing later on. Um, now, a seemingly failure in, uh, in terms of foreign relations that Kennedy suffered was the Berlin crisis. So this all starts with uh, the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev. Remember, Germany or East Germany is a satellite state of the Soviet Union, meaning that they are an independent country, but they are literally under the control of the Soviet Union. So he decides that he's going to float out this idea um, because there's a lot of people leaving East Berlin into West Berlin. East Berlin's controlled by the Soviet Union, West Berlin's controlled by uh, the United States and its allies. And so people in East Berlin who do not like the Soviet communist regime and the life that is forced upon them by that want to go over to West Berlin, which is much more, uh, it's, it's a democratic government, and they, because of the spread of American businesses and American goods, there's, it's almost almost like moving into the United States. So you have a lot of people moving from one side of the city to the other, and at this point, there's nothing stopping them. So Khrushchev floats the idea that why doesn't Berlin get united and the Soviet Union and the East Berlin government have control over it? Of course, the United States says no. Um, we're not just gonna leave those people in West Berlin to all of a sudden become come under an authoritarian regime. So Khrushchev responds by building the Berlin Wall. So it's a wall that cuts the city in half. Uh, and you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, the wall was actually on two sides. And in the middle was this stretch that was patrolled by uh, military, the uh, Soviet and East German military. It also included landmines, so if somebody tried to run across, they could be blown up or they would be shot 
and it was a good deterrent to keep people on one side of the wall. Problem in the long run was it split families up. If you lived literally on either side of that street that they built the wall on, your family was separated and you'd have to risk death to be reunited. And again, the wall was hopefully to drive the United States into going, okay, we'll let you have both sides of the city. But that never came to happen. Eventually in 1989, uh, the, as the Cold War is ending, Berlin and Germany unite and the wall gets torn down. All right, one minute and I'll begin explaining. All right, I'm going to try and do this quickly. So the origins of the Vietnam War do not start in the 1960s. They do not start in the 1950s. It actually goes back to the late 1800s. So when, way back when we were talking about World War I and European countries, and France was included in this, were expanding out, taking over uh, less developed countries. Uh, so they use their military technology to go in and take control of areas. France decides, for some reason, that they want to go into Southeast Asia, where modern-day Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Thailand, um, list goes on. But uh, the countries south of China, essentially, is what we're talking about here, but not India. Um, that's a whole other story. Anyway, so they take control of that area and they rule it. Um, there's, no, there's no kind way of saying it. They, were, they uh, instigated racist practices. They created uh, hierarchical systems among the people so that there was like a chosen few that got all the wealth and got all the benefits and turned the majority of people who lived in Southeast Asia into literally a slave class. So um, again, World War II puts a lot of things on hold, especially people who are seeking freedom um, because they have to fight against the Japanese. So in Southeast Asia, the same thing happened with China. Is that remember in China, they were having a communist uh, revolt and they paused it during World War II so that they could fight the Japanese. Same thing happens in Southeast Asia, particularly in what becomes Vietnam is they, there's this liberation movement happening. They gotta say time out so that they can fight with American allies to uh, defeat the Japanese. So once World War II is over, then everything starts right back again. There, there's no like, okay, we all got along, let's, let's try and figure something new out. It's, they literally go right back to it, same as what happened in China. And the Vietnamese liberation movement is led by a man named Ho Chi Minh. And he, there's a long backstory to this, but really his main thing was he was trying to liberate the Vietnamese from the French and create an independent country of, uh, of ethnic Vietnamese. But France did not want to give that up. And this is a contradiction. Remember, France is a democratic country. They're supposed to be promoting democratic ideals, yet they're ruling these people in Southeast Asia with an iron fist. But France, because they have to direct their resources back to rebuilding their country after World War II, begins to lose the fight against, um, the, fight against the Vietnamese. Now we're gonna talk about when the United States comes in. 
uh, on the next on the last slide. But the main thing here is what brings the United States in is this idea of the domino theory, and that we've already we had already seen. China fall to communism, North Korea fall to communism, and then that started the Korean War. And so there's this idea among intellectuals in Washington, D.C., is that if Vietnam becomes communist, and that was Ho Chi Minh was being supported by the North Koreans and by the Chinese and by the Soviet Union to create a communist nation, is that if Vietnam fell, then all the other countries around Vietnam would fall, the Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and so on and so forth, as dominoes falling down. One minute, and then I'll start explaining. Okay, so it's this domino theory that gets the United States involved. First, it was we were just helping out the French. And when we saw that the French couldn't handle this, we're not interested in actually controlling Vietnam, but we want to make sure that Vietnam doesn't become communist. So where it really begins, it actually started back in the Eisenhower administration, but Back then, we're only sending over like a handful of top military individuals to begin training pro-democratic Vietnamese in, uh, in defending themselves and then eventually in the hopes that they would take over the entire country. So when President Kennedy ups it a little bit, and so instead of like maybe a thousand top military officials, he starts sending over several thousand to, to amp up, to quicken the pace of training the, the, the pro-democratic Vietnamese and, uh, and fighting the communist Vietnamese. So, and at this point, Vietnam has split into two. There's a North Vietnam and there's a South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese are the communists. The South Vietnamese are the pro-democracy. Uh, uh, group. So now you have, they have two different sides, same as with Korea. It got split into a North and South. So when Kennedy was assassinated, that's where it was. He did not want to commit the entire American military to Vietnam. He only wanted to support pro-democratic Vietnamese in doing so. Now later on in this chapter, we're going to get into what happens particularly in South Vietnam, that creates this, um, that eventually really amps up the war. But all that's going to take place during President Lyndon Johnson's administration. Uh, so as soon as President Johnson comes in, he immediately increases the U.S. military presence. So we're talking maybe from you know, 2,500 soldiers to he's sending over about 10,000. And the idea was to let the South Vietnamese or the pro-democratic Vietnamese do the majority of the fighting. And the United States is there just to back them up. So it starts by we send over our air force because the South Vietnamese really didn't have an air force. And we start bombing North Vietnam. And then when that's not stopping the North Vietnamese, then we start sending over ground troops. And they start fighting alongside the South Vietnamese. And again, we're going to get into why this creates a lot of complications um, uh, most of them negative, uh, are in fact all of them negative. But the key thing when it when the war, when this conflict ends up under the control of President Lyndon Johnson, 
is that around the same time there was this event called the Gulf of Tonkin incident that leads to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which is an American naval ship which was doing blockades of the Gulf of Tonkin was attacked. They blamed it on the North Vietnamese. And so President Johnson was able to get Congress to issue a decree giving him almost unlimited war power. So this is when he really amps up uh, sending over U.S. troops. And he essentially can do this without Congress's approval. And this is going to create a lot of problems in the future. So this is what turns the Vietnam conflict into the Vietnam War and is what propels the United States into becoming the primary force in fighting. And that's where we will leave it today.